No matter how much you try, you're really at the end of the day, you're just offering a, a product or a service that lots of other people are. And there's nothing particularly that shiny about it or that really stands out, but you just love doing it. You're really passionate about it. That's when you're going to get yourself into trouble because you do have to have a point of difference. You do have to have something a little bit extra shiny than everybody else. And you have to be knowledgeable about a way of marketing that point of difference. Because if you can't say, hey, no, no, pick me, don't pick him or her. And and, and if you can't uh, have that ability for the market to go, oh, oh, okay, yes, I'll go with you, as opposed to him or her, then you really are never going to be able to win in that world. Welcome to the Seven Hats Podcast. My name is Yuval Selig. And I've been on the entrepreneurial roller coaster for over 20 years. I've experienced it all throughout my journey the grind, burnout, failure, and ultimately, success. The turning point for me was realizing that building a successful company is meaningless if you neglect the other significant areas of your life. So today, I'm inviting you to join me on an adventure through those seven areas, what I call the seven hats. Every week, my guests and I will drop valuable insights and pearls of wisdom, helping, motivating, and inspiring you to get your seven hats in order and deliver real impact with meaning. So let's get going. Welcome, seven hatters. In this episode, we speak with Daryl Lovegrove and dive deep into hat numbers one and four, the soul and the entrepreneur, as we take the stage and go for the high notes in all things show and business. Daryl Lovegrove knows what it means to give it a go and never take no for an answer as he has done it all. An Australian Event Awards Entertainer of the Year, a musical theater star, and a co-creator of the global operatic entertainment phenomenon, The Three Waiters, performed over 13,000 times and seen in 90 countries. Daryl brings his story of passion, purpose, in good old-fashioned blood, sweat, and tears. So without further ado, let's raise the curtain and welcome Daryl to The Seven Hats. Daryl, welcome to The Seven Hats. G'day, and uh, so great to be here. And uh, hi to everybody listening. How you all doing? I love the accent. I'm going to just love this conversation. I could tell you right off the bat. All right, Daryl. So let's get this out of the way. I kind of understand your world. I'm married to an actor. And what a soul crushing life that can be <laughs> if you're not super aware and super careful not to let that happen. You know, I see my wife and other actors waking up every day and pouring their heart and soul into their craft to try to capture one of the few great roles that are available. And for the most part, it's all about rejection. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. And the sad part about us is, is that we, we we do know that, but we also know that if we didn't give it a go, we would spend the rest of our lives regretting it. So, um, and and then so we give it a go, and we spend the, li- the rest of our lives regretting it anyway. But <laughs> you would sort of lose either way. Tough skin. You gotta have a tough skin. You really do. You you definitely do. But yet. Here you are, you've been a successful actor and you've created successful businesses as well. And I'm guessing you were primed for greatness from a very young age. So let's talk about your childhood and where you came from and what your upbringing was like. Where were you born and how was your childhood like? Okay, so I was born in Auckland, New Zealand. I think the same hospital as Lord on the North Shore of Auckland. And um, spent the, but immediately as a seven-month-old, I went to live in Malawi, Eastern Africa, for about three years. And then I went to Geneva and Switzerland for three years. And I, I, went, I started school there. My dad was a, a lawyer and he, he wanted to uh, work overseas, firstly as a lecturer in, in Malawi. And then he worked for the United Nations in Geneva. Uh, then mum and dad split up when I was about five, six years old. And um, he went to live in Hong Kong and I went back to New Zealand with my brother who'd just been born in Switzerland and um, we lived with mum mum back in New Zealand and we would go and visit dad sort of twice a year uh, up in Hong Kong. So I had an amazing experience of growing up in, a, in an African um, sort of town. Wow. And I was a white haired boy. I, I had whiter hair than Boris Johnson. I was so was so white and and I would and be in my stroller going down into the local market and everyone would always want to come around and touch me. There was oh there's a little white kid with a with a with his white hair and they would touch me. and I'm so apparently I, I was a little prince and uh, <laughs> you know 
People wanted to come up and touch me. And then in Geneva, in Switzerland, uh, was you know had that great European ex- experience. But it was it was great going to school there, and and um, and then of course I had the Asian experience going to Hong Kong twice a year. So I was really blessed with a childhood actually of lots of world travel, lots of experiences that you just wouldn't get if I just stayed growing up in suburban uh, New Zealand. And um, the cut long story short, went to boarding school for eight years, which was an amazing experience. Enjoyed it very much. But I always wanted to be in the arts. I, w- I wanted to be a performer. Uh, like a, a lot of your listeners, I would imagine that we all need that push, that that kind of um, moment where, seminal moment where you make that decision that this is where I want to go. And and my big sort of uh, epiphany was when I was seven years old, I was forced to go and see a movie by my aunt. Uh, who, and I didn't want to see it. I wanted to see a Clint Eastwood movie. It was a school holiday. And she sat me down and she told me to be quiet and stop complaining. And it was a movie called Jesus Christ Superstar as a seven-year-old. And and I sat down there very frustrated, annoyed. And then the lights went down and this movie started happening. And there was rock and roll everywhere and people were screaming at each other. And it was simply the greatest thing that I'd ever, ever seen. And I just was sitting there completely gobsmacked by it. And I didn't realize that as a performer, you could do that. You could you could let your heart out and sing and scream and, and rock and roll and and be so emotional and 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 have these incredible characters collide and so much tension and so much with everything that goes with it. And I came out of that, you know, with the violence of the whipping, the crucifixion, everything, very disturbed but exhilarated at the same time. All of a sudden, the world had given me permission to dream about about being an actor, about being a performer, about being a rock star in ways that just, you know, two hours previously, I had no idea. And that kept me with me and it's, it's been an inspiration ever since. And one well, amazing story about that is that, uh, what, uh, I suppose 20 years later, I ended up being New Zealand's first Jesus in the New Zealand and Australian tour of Jesus Christ Superstar. So it's one of those amazing uh, situations in my life. But I've been very lucky. When, when, I, when I left school, I immediately got a, a teaching degree. You know, we've all had a tough time this last uh, two years. And I've, I've decided to go, I went back to the classroom. You know, my business is completely shattered with COVID. What am I going to do? And I thought, that's right, I'm a teacher. (laughs) And so I went back into the classroom and I've been in front of kids for two years and I've absolutely loved it. But as as Australia and and the world is coming out of COVID, well, I I hope we're coming out of COVID to some kind of degree. I'm I'm veering back into the business, um, which we'll talk about soon, I'm sure. Um, but I've absolutely loved being able to fall back on that teaching, which has been great. But when I left school, I, you know, I, I got that degree and then I flew over to Australia because they auditioned in New Zealand for uh, the first year's turnover of the cast of Les Miserables. It was, you know, the original Sydney cast. They'd done a year and then um, some people were, were leaving. And so I, I was able to replace one of those people. So it was a fantastic first introduction. My first professional show was Les Mis as a rather big show to go into. So I all of a sudden I was living in Australia and in Sydney and doing Les Miserables, the biggest show in the Southern Hemisphere at the, t- at the time. And uh, won the Australian singing competition after that, and was lucky to get enough to get into Chess, the uh, the musical Chess, written by of course Benny and Bjorn from ABBA and Tim Rice, who, who was also the lyricist to Superstar. And then I went to uh, do lots of plays and stuff like that. And then I got the big role of Jesus in the mid '90s. That was a um, huge experience for me. Eighteen months. A seven or eight city tour over over eighteen months and uh, playing to you know two thousand people eight times a week, kind of was was extraordinary. And after that, oh, I you know I had a, a really great uh, two or three years in plays and in musicals. But the late nineties was all about my maid and I. We were we were flatmates and we were good mates. And uh, one day we we accidentally I won't go into the the full details of it because it takes a little bit of time. But we, act, well, I put the word accidentally because that's really what it was. We, we put this together, this idea for a corporate show. You guys sometimes call them industrials. Basically a show, an entertainment act that suits the, the, the a gala dinner market. You know, when you go into awards nights or charity nights or even a wedding reception, a place where you sit down and have a three-course meal and there's speeches and um, uh, there's maybe a presentation or something like that. Um, that's called we call it the corporate entertainment market in Australia. Uh, we put an act together for that market. It's a very lucrative market, and, um, uh, and and we dressed up three opera singers as waiters. 
And we, they walk around and they, and one's, an Italian, one's pretending to be an Italian, one's pretending to be a Frenchman and the others are local. And we basically go to each table with our accents and have a little conversation with, with the people on the tables and walk off. And, and hopefully the idea is that by this hoax, this huge hoax that we're, we're putting on, that people are sitting there going, oh, okay, wow, he said, we've got a few European waiters walking around the room at the moment. That's interesting, you know, kind of thing. And so when the, on, you, what, what you, you guys call the entree, we call it the main meals, the big one, the main major meal goes down onto the tables. We take over with a very funny, interactive, what we call three tenors style show. And to those of you not quite sure what the three tenors are, in the 90s, there were three opera singers, the biggest opera singers in the world, Pavarotti, Domingo, and Carreras came together for the 1992 Soccer World Final in, in Spain, I think it was, somewhere in Europe. They did what, what they thought was going to be a one-off, and it exploded, and it, they became the biggest rock stars of the 90s. They, they were selling out more shows than the Rolling Stones. And, and it, so the three tenors were a very important pop cultural figure in the 90s. They were massive. And they, they literally did two or three world tours in, in that 10-year period. So if there wasn't, wasn't any three tenors, there wouldn't be any three waiters. And that's what we, Mark and I had created were, were this thing called the three waiters. And it exploded. And our, we, did, we, we, put, we put the show out, you know, and it immediately got an incredible result. We thought, well, this is amazing. This, this would be fun. Hopefully we get, you know, two or three a month. That would be great. Well, we quickly were doing five a week. And um, this was not stopping, and it was this wildfire. We could see it everywhere. The phones were going. Every show we did would, would result in three more shows. And the phones would go the next day saying, oh, my God, oh, my God, I, I, I saw your show last night. Can you please do my event? And oh, people would ring up saying, I've just had a friend who's just been raving about you who's got your card. Can you do my event? And whatever. And this just got bigger and bigger. And we, we were flying all around Asia, Australia, New Zealand. And then we eventually decided, look, this has clearly got incredible scope and, and, and scale, potential of scale. And we took it to England in 2000 and the United States in 2001. Long story sh uh, short, which I write in my new book, <laughs> um, uh, we, we've, to date, the show itself has been performed 14,000 times and it's been seen in 90 countries. That's nine zero, 90 countries. So it's it became a phenomenon, crazy. So that's sort of like leading up to um, um, 2009, where I actually sold out back in 2009 after 11 years, and I created my own company. So that, in a nutshell, it, it, I created Love Grove Entertainment, and that's that's gone through its own trials and tribulations with the global financial crisis, and now, of course, COVID. But I do want to, I love, uh, lucky to say, like, hopefully a lot of your listeners do what I love, and um, but with all the slings and arrows and the curveballs along the way, and it hasn't been a joy ride the whole time at all. Um, and um, I'm sure we'll talk about some of those things. Yeah, we'll we'll dig into all of that. But I do want to go back for a second because you know you have seven years old. You're seeing Jesus Christ Superstar. Obviously, there's a full circle moment when you're performing in it. Was your family supportive when you went into acting? Yeah, they they were uh, to a certain extent. Um, they were a little bit though. And I and I listened to them. They were a little bit like, "Can you maybe something to fall back on?" <laughs> they, they, as a kid, I was, you know, I was, I was the talented one. I was the one who was given the lead roles in the shows at, at school, and everyone knew that uh, Daryl was a bit, bit strange, and you know, he was, he was a bit dramatic, <laughs> and you know, liked to act and sing. And I was in the school choirs, and, and I played the lead, lead in the, in the leads in the uh, school musicals. And then they knew that's what I wanted to do, but they were also worried that I was going in. You know, in an, in an, uh, a market that's very, very difficult, as you yes. know, with your wife. Um, and so that's why I did the teaching degree. And I'm really glad I did because COVID was, um, you know, I had to do something else. Couldn't sit at home the whole time. And I've, and I've absolutely loved teaching. So that to, so that, that's the answer is that they both did kind of come from my mother, especially. She was a very, very talented young girl. She entered lots of competitions and won singing stuff. But she never ever did it professionally. And Dad was a great Elvis fan, you know, with the grease back black hair, and and in his teen years had the guitar. And he was he was a bit of a, um, you know, um, he, he was he loved that kind of world in the, in the late fifties and sixties of playing the guitar and Elvis numbers. Um, and and Mum was kind of quite theatrical, but neither of them ever did it professionally. They didn't didn't even do amateur stuff. They they just um, it was kind of a hobby for them. 
but all of a sudden their son was being serious about taking it to the next level. Yeah. So so they did did support me and obviously still do. Was it an easy path for you? Because, you you know, I I doubt, did you get Jesus Christ Superstar or Les Mis as soon as you started acting? Or was there kind of that difficult path before you, you know, got to success? And do you feel you were lucky or unlucky in your acting career? Oh, I was lucky. Yeah. No, I was lucky. Um, I'll, I'll be honest. The the acting thing, um, I was very lucky. I managed to get get roles pretty quickly. Um, look, it's, I think I was going for roles which needed a big rock voice, and that's what I have. Um, and so uh, I just happened to always be the right place. To, not always. Um, most of the time would, would, would get the role. There's sometimes I, I, obviously I wouldn't. And the older I've got, the the um i noticed uh, after a few years i was getting less and less because it's a young really young man's game those major roles in those musicals are for 18 to 24 year olds and once you get over that that 24 25 you're all of a sudden not the young guy they're looking for because you need to be standing next to someone and looking in the eyes of a 17 18 19 20 year old it gets a bit icky when you're in your late twenties. Yes, <laughs> looking at someone who's a girl who's supposed to be playing an 18, 19, 20 year old. So, so uh, you've got to, they, they, yeah, the, and the, those romantic leads can can and they only have a certain shelf life. So I was lucky; I was able to to play some of those um, roles, like like Marius. I was understanding Marius and Les Mis, and I was, I was understanding the American in chess. And then Jesus was my first major role. Uh, luckily, that wasn't a romantic one. That one, but uh, <laughs> um, but then I, you know, did a lot of plays and played more nitty, nitty gritty stuff. But I've, I, but in, in, again, I'm still pretty lucky. I, I, I guess I know the industry so well, and um, you know, I, I can see the the journeys of other actors, and I'd have to say I'm definitely on the more luckier side. Yeah, you know, it's 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 funny because I think you have experience in this, and I, I want to ask you this question. And I think it's it's acting and business or just life in general, but let's let's say acting or life. It's really about resilience, right? And getting back after you've been knocked down. And you know, that's why all the actors and entrepreneurs I know are a little bit crazy because you know, any sane person, rational person couldn't possibly face that much rejection, you know, and disappointment and keep coming back for more. How did you deal with the rejection? How do you know, like, how did other people in your life deal with the rejection of just getting up every day and getting punched in the face? Yep, it's a great question, that. And the first thing you've got to do is understand if you're going to be an actor, you've got to be out of work more than you're going to be in work. What also helps is when you spend time having lots of coffees and and beers with um, your fellow actors who have all gone through the same sob stories. So you've got to realize that to, to not to take it personally. And I have luckily, Yuval, I've been on the um, decision-making side of the table and I've, I've had to hire lots of performers myself. And that's when you which when you really realise that all the time that you were an actor, it, they weren't sitting there wanting to be mean to you or, you know, for, for you for it to be nasty. They're really looking for spe- a specific look and a feel from someone who stands in front of them. That's all they're looking for. And if you just happen to be that then you've got to show, you know, you've got a chance of going through the recalls and then and then eventually when they get it right down, you might be the top three um, that they're looking for. If you can understand that and not take it personally, and also, you know, if you are, I, I suppose that a lot of actors do, you know, if they do find that, gosh, no matter what they do, no matter what song they bring or what, what monologue they bring to an audition, if they're continually just not getting roles, then maybe there is something about what they offer does have limited appeal and um, because that's what it is you're simply you're a what are you your component in, 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 a, in a big mach- a machine that needs to be able to rely on you to stand on a stage or or in front of a camera and be able to be that character that they really need you to be and hit those marks and uh con- convincingly uh, take the the audience on a journey and with with a group of other people and um, if you just don't have that look and whatever that that kind of persona of the character they're looking for, then you you know you've just got to accept that and 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 walk away and and hopefully there's something else comes along. Um, gosh, that's all I can really say in that area because it's such a such a tough business and and there really are spectacularly talented people who who just for some reason or another can't seem to get a break. Yeah. Um, 
But and in my in my experience, you know, the people who did did get breaks, you know, really do have uh, something about them that um, appeals. You can see why it appeals to producers and directors, and and I could see, I could, I mean, you know, I, I could see why they chose me in, in certain roles. Um, I, I was right for Marius at the time and Lemus. I was right for the American at the time. I was right for Jesus. You know, I can't play Jesus now. I'm too old for it. And I, plus, I've lost half the hair. You know, um, <laughs> but at the time, I had good. I, I had enough hair and. And I looked kind of good for for the role, and and I managed, and I was able to totally uh, sing that sing that very demanding role. So you know, I was, that's that's the bit about the luck bit, isn't it? You know, you've either kind of got what they're looking for, or you don't. And if you sp- continually don't have what they're looking for, then maybe, yeah, maybe you need to do something else. Yeah, and it's and it's true. I mean, you say make sure you have something to fall back on. And this is not just for actors. This is for entrepreneurs. You have a great dream and 95% of the you know businesses fail. Yeah. So the reality is how do you have a backup, right? Where you're spending time on it because you need to, right? In order for that to be successful, but you have a passion and a dream of mm-hmm. a project or projects or events that are not really happening. When do you give up? Like, when do you just say, you know what? I have this dream, but- it's not happening because it's that, that conundrum of when do I give up? Um, that's the oh, that's the alternal question for any any entrepreneur. Gosh, in in um in the last twelve years, my market that I that I, I um I'm playing in the world of corporate entertainment post three waiters, which was just a ridiculous worldwide global success, and then when I developed Love Grove Entertainment. The whole market change, and there's been times when I've re- I thought, and I still do today, I know that the world's corporate entertainment market will never be the same again. Um, it won't be anything like the late, late 90s and the noughties when um, I had this amazing show to offer the world. Uh, it doesn't matter what show I have today, it'll just simply, it, the market isn't there like it used to be. The people are not prepared to spend the kinds of money they used to spend. People don't want to necessarily do big gala dinners um, in the way that they they used to want to yep. do it, and so you know tastes have changed, and 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 they're always going to be no matter what we do. An audience is never going to stay the same unless I guess if you're you know you're supplying water or or absolutely essential central uh, goods. But even then, I think I know people. I know a lot, I, I belong to a business uh, association here in uh, Australia called Business Blueprint, and. You know, I'm sitting down with entrepreneurs, um, you know, four times a year uh, at, a, at a three-day conference, and their stories are very similar to mine, uh, even though it's not in the world of entertainment. It's the world of, uh, you know, they're supplying stuff that people really need, a lot of them, and, and others are supplying, you know, uh, stuff that they don't, people don't really need, but hopefully, you know, they can still sell it, you know, um, like myself. And so, therefore, um, the conundrum, they're all, I think the, the, the conundrum is, is uh, are you still in a position to, uh, if you're not offering the goods and services to people that will really change their lives or really offer something to the market that no one else has, you, that's what you have to be. If it comes to the point when, look, if you, if this because competition is is walking all over, you can't compete. Uh, and no matter how much you try, you, you're really, really at the end of the day, you're just offering a, a product or a service that lots of other people are, and there's nothing particularly that shiny about it, or that really stands out. But you just love doing it, and you're really passionate about it. That's when you're going to get yourself into trouble, because you do have to have a point of difference. You do have to have something a little bit extra shiny than everybody else, and you have to be knowledgeable about a way of marketing that point of difference. Because if you can't say, "Hey, no, no, pick me. Don't pick him or her. Pick me," and 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 if you can't uh, have that ability for the market to go, oh, oh, okay, yes, I'll go with you, as opposed to him or her, then then you really are never going to be able to uh, uh, win in that world. And it probably is best to walk away because we can have, we can come up with an incredible product or service, but if it doesn't really stand out, if it really doesn't have a point of difference to your competitors, then you're going to be always climbing that hill, pulling your hair out, wondering why can't I get this thing really scaling it? Why can't I do something with, where I can abandon any other thoughts of, of having to fall back on anything else and just concentrate and focus on this and this will give me everything I, I want from it? I, you know, I'm in, in many ways, 
the three waiters story is one that Mark and I we we never did it to take on the world and and uh, and be and when it, it 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 forced itself on us we we put it together as a bit of a joke really did in the late nineties and because we Mark was a social photographer a very good one and I was an actor and, and I was doing very well so we 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 would do this as a hobby as a fun thing a bit of a joke and it exploded and next thing we had to think and and, and six months later oh my god what do we do with this this bomb that it just continually goes off um but that but the post three way to story for me is when when i developed the, the, my company is that all of a sudden those that whole market had changed and so now i had to really work hard at getting the same people who had who had booked the three waiters to book my new shows um which were which were not the three waiters and um, but they they had they had fantastic i think it's most of them still going today and they've had lots of longevity, but nothing like this, like the the amount of of work that the three waiters got. So therefore, I've become almost this kind of very small business, and I still do it because um, you know I I, um, I I still absolutely love it. I'm still passionate about it, and it's what I want to do. Uh, and and um, and it, it still makes me enough to obviously to um, get by um, comfortably. Um, but it's not like the, the crazy days. No one's getting rich anymore. Let's put it that way. In the world of in my world of corporate entertainment, if I def, if I had, had put together the three waiters today, it would yes, it would still it would cause some kind of ripple effect and uh, and it would do pretty well. But nothing like it did in the late nineties and noughties because simply the the market's just not there. There's just not that enough people putting on dinners like they did in that time and and prepared to throw money. Uh, and the way that they did. So everything just changed enormously with the global financial crisis. And now, of course, uh, and, and, and now, of course, uh, and 9 11 also affected it tremendously as well. Not, I, I've had to go through 9 11, global financial crisis, and now COVID in, in a world with a very discretionary spend. <laughs> as you can imagine, you know, people don't have to spend money on getting entertainment to their dinner. You've got to really spend a lot of time. Selling the dream, selling the and my, and my business, selling the dream, selling the image. Hey, this is going to happen. This is how your audience are going to feel when they consume this product. This is what's going to happen. This is the takeaway they're going to get. And so I've had to pivot a lot um, in the last ten years because I I don't just do now sell corporate entertainment. Now I I'm obviously I'm speaking a lot of conferences and and hosting a lot of events as well, which has been the the biggest plus for me um, in in the last a post global financial crisis was was my ability to reinvent myself and reinvention is a very important thing yeah um, i'm not sure if I, if we will have time today to talk about that but that's sort of definitely one of the components of my book is that um covid has really uh, up, uh changed the landscape for us entrepreneurs hugely and i think we're going to find our audience our market have changed their tastes, have changed the way that they're willing to consume products and services. And so it's up to us to find out, to talk to them. Hey, do you still need what I what I produce? Do you still, do you still need the service that I provide? And and do you, do you still want to receive it the same way as before? Or have things changed? You know? So, yeah, at Conundrum, uh, uh, the question is the Conundrum is, <sighs> I know I am still producing... I, I still have a point of difference. Uh, my shows uh, are very much, you know, the world of musical theatre and opera. They're really tough to put together. Most people in the entertainment world do not have opera shows or musical theatre shows. So I'm lucky in that sense that it's, it's very hard to put together those types of top-end shows uh, where people are prepared to pay a premium, clients are prepared to pay a premium for. And so um, that's that's a, 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 a niche that I like being in and I'm really good at. Um, but most people in the entertainment world, you know, supply bands and um, kind of tribute shows and stuff like that. I have a band, and I've I've got a kind of a kind of a tribute show, but I've got lots of other sort of more high end stuff as well, and that that keeps me keeps me in the game. So conundrum is, yeah, are you re- I, I, you've got to you've got to be so hard on yourself. If it's a, a question of, of you're pulling your hair out, you're you're losing quality of life, you're unhappy. And it's really because if you ask yourself the tough questions, it's because nothing that I'm really putting out there is that different to my competitors. It's not really solving people's problems. It's not really adding value to people's lives. Then it probably is time to move. Yeah, I think point of differentiation is the key word here. You know, and you mentioned 
And but that that also is it is something to think about because you mentioned that in rock and roll and in opera, the high notes are the ones that get you noticed. But those high notes are the riskiest notes yes. for, you for, read the book about for the singer, right? They're the high notes are the riskiest notes for the singer or the entrepreneur. How do you take that leap? Why do you think most people never even go and reach for those high notes in their lives? Despite, you know, a lot of people have greatness in them, but they never even try to achieve it. Oh, that's, that's a great question. Um, okay. Why don't they do it? Because I think most people have, have a fear of failure. And that's a really important one. I mean, I have a fear of trying certain things. I, I understand a fear of failure concept. I understand how a lot of people go, well, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to have to save up, you know, 50000 maybe $100,000 uh, or whatever and slip it into and, and create capital that I can invest in this, this um, idea I have. Now, that's hugely uh, uh, risky. You have to really believe what you're doing. You have to have some... I, oh gosh, you know, real chutzpah to be able to um, um, go out and do that sort of thing. And uh, you know, I can I can understand why people have a fear of failure. That's the that's the major thing is is a fear of is a fear of failure. Um, and if, I guess too, some people are also scared of success. Success does change everything, uh, and and it, it is and it can be an absolutely wonderful thing, certainly in theory, but it also can it can create a whole bunch of new problems. Look. You know, you know what it's like, Yuval. Uh, you've been through an incredible uh, life journey yourself, and and uh, the entrepreneur story is one of um, incredible highs and lows. And if you you've got to be willing to to take them both, and because they both got you know the lows can teach you a heck of a lot and make you grow enormously, and the highs can can be quite detrimental. If you're complacent about it, if you uh, about success, if you're um, uh, and not, if you're kind of like sort of think just reading your good reviews and not the bad ones, or you kind of think it's all going to be smooth sailing and because you you success and you deserved it and it's all fine, whatever, and you're not prepared to um, keep an eye on the road and uh, see, make sure that you you're 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 staying at that level that you've you've achieved, then you can fall and. Uh, um, then it then it can get get pretty pretty messy. I guess why do people read, read some of people reach through high notes of life? Uh, it's 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 to do with your inner core of passion and drive. Uh, maybe they're not quite passionate enough. Um, if there's a fear of failure, um, there's uh, uh, they're scared of success. Uh, I guess those are the first three things that come into my mind because uh, you know we all have great ideas, but unless we take action, and, and you as you know in my book, I talk about. The five things which are so important, and I guess if you don't follow these four or five things, you might have another road. But the five things I, I look at, and I look at people who have been successful, um, is the first thing is purpose. Maybe their purpose isn't right, Yuval. You know, purpose is so important. That's the first one I always start off with. You know, what is it really in one sentence? Can you actually say that you want to do with your life? Uh, it took me years to to work it out. Um, I, I have a simple sentence: I want to entertain and educate. That's it. That's what I'm going to do. I want to entertain and educate. And that, to do that, I have to take action. I have to get out there and I have to find ways of entertaining people. And I have to find ways of educating people. And it's all pretty, I know where the, the avenues are, and I have to take action and get on with it. And then I have to be, build build momentum, which which goes with that. And the momentum comes and goes. But um, as long as I'm, um, I'm, I, I know that, then um, I can go with it. Now, along the way, I'm going to be, I'm going to receive a whole bunch of curveballs and massive hills to climb, brick walls I'm going to smash into that I didn't know existed. If I've got that mentality, that that willingness to um, uh, persevere, then I'm I'm going to probably struggle. But if, if I do have a willingness to, willingness to persevere and take those those um, slings and arrows, those curveballs, then I've actually got a very good chance of making it through. Um, and to a point, even maybe of attaining self-belief. And self-belief is massively important, um, where you really believe in what you're doing, that you can achieve anything that you can, that you, that you want. So um, those, are the, those are the things that if you have that, you should be able to reach uh, uh, those high notes in life, um, not just um, as a singer performing the high notes, the rock and roll high notes, but as you, as you mentioned, the high notes in life, the things that get us noticed, the things that people take notice of us about, um, that, that we are really remembered for. Everybody growing up as a kid, we all remember the things that absolutely thrilled us, whether it was 
the first time we ever were at a water slide and um or the first time we've stood in front of a group of people and and said something about something people went hey yeah you're really smart you're really clever you're really cool about that and and people we were taken seriously and we were given dignity because of, of something that we believed in or we offered you know our communities or, or something that our cousins or our, or our family you know held us up for and they said you're really good at that you should work at that and it made us feel good um and that's something that our teachers said we all our, men, our teachers at school who at, at one stage or another mentioned, hey, you're doing really well there. That's you, you make an interesting point. You you write really well, or you you're really good at working things out in the, this area. You know, those are things where we go, oh, am I? Wow. Oh gosh, that makes me feel good. I like being told I'm good at a certain some sort of in some area, and that's a highlight, a high note in your life. And so what 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 my book is all about is trying to find ways of hitting those high notes time and time again. If you're not prepared to be really ambitious and and have passion and and have purpose and take action and have the ability to persevere, then you won't hit those high notes. And and that's my take of it. Um, I mean, why people don't reach high notes? That that's awesome. So you talk about you talk about purpose, action, resilience, focus, and values. And to you, that's peak performance, right? So tell us about. How did you come up with peak performance and those attributes that somehow pertain to that, to, to peak performance? When I wrote my book during COVID, I remember, uh, you know, two years ago, I thought, well, God, this whole world has just turned upside down. I provide a very discretionary spend product and it's not even a fence, let alone <laughs> opportunities. That, I mean, the events are just gone. There. So there's, my phone's not going to be ringing for an, a, a, a long time, and which has turned out to be the case. So I thought, what am I going to do? And, and of course, I, I did go back into teaching. But then I thought, so uh, people for years have been saying, you need to tell your story. Because I, I, I spoke, I speak at many conferences and um, uh, and people said, even at conferences, you need to write a book. You need to write a book. And I went, oh, no, no, no. And then all of a sudden, uh, I've given the situation where there's nothing going on. I'm at home every night. Well, usually I'm out two or three times a week at some event. So I thought, okay, well, no, no, no. Maybe I write a book, <laughs> and and so that's what I guess you've got. When you sit down and write a book, that's an experience where you do do go deep, and you start to you start to look at look at what are, you know. What you're writing down things that you think uh, sort of uh, are, are parts of your story. What what are the things that drive you as an individual, and uh, and you start to put those words into Google, and you see what comes up, and you start to read other people's stories, similar stories, and the, and then but then. When you really start writing, you'd be amazed what comes out um, and what just pours out of your subconscious. Um, and those are the, the things you mentioned really became my pillars of what I call peak performance. And that is purpose, action, you know, resilience, uh, as you say, self-belief, focus, values. Um, they're, they're just those are the kind of the seven or eight major pillars that I, I wrote down as being what I think um, make up peak performance. And I know that other people would, would talk about other things and maybe, you know, say a few of my pillars aren't as important as maybe I think they are. I don't know. But um, it's my kind of, I guess, uh, effort at trying to contribute into the space and try to provide some kind of value for, for people to read and, and hopefully take something away to motivate, to inspire. And um, I've had some you know, great feedback from from a lot of people who, who say that I have touched a nerve and, and which is great. I think too, Yuval, um, that there's a lot of people, a lot of people who who um, would look would be listening to this podcast, or maybe read my book, or or read read other people's books in the, in the same kind of genre, and they know deep inside that they have to make some serious changes in their lives, or they have to go down a road which is very very risky, and they have to be told, taken by the scruff of the neck, and say, listen, stop it. Enough is enough. You need to go down this road and do it and stop procrastinating. And Or it might be something as simple as you, you need to do this, but you also need to stop smoking cigarettes and getting drunk all the time You need because you're about to go into a world where your health needs to be at its optimum level. Um, you have to stop abandoning this idea that technology is a pain in the neck. Of course it is. I hate technology, but I'm, I'm, I, I have to embrace it massively because that's otherwise I'm not going to have a business. That's where my clients are. That's where their eyeballs are. And I have to make sure I've got my advertising in front of their eyeballs. And so I have to embrace technology, even though I hate it. And, and I have to do all of that kind of stuff. So I guess there's a lot of people who, who have to be told this because otherwise they'll, they will never do it. 
you know, they're afraid of doing it. They they don't, you know, they, they know very well that they have to make some big changes in their lives if they really want to be happier people. Hopefully some sometime, you know, uh, my, if my book or my, my keynotes can make people go, yeah, look, I've got to stop some bad behavior that I do. I've got to stop it if I'm going to really achieve what I want to do. And because there's a lot of people do have bad behavior. I, I still, you, you and I, we, we, we do all have bad behaviors, which get in the way of impede what, what we really want to do. But I, I've made a big effort in, in some things over the last 10 years, especially to have less of in my life so I can have a more productive life and, and, a, and a, a hopefully a more happy life. And I'm happy to say those things have paid off very well. I'm just a far healthier person than I was 12 years ago. Um, and um, I'm, I'm, I watch what I eat a lot more. I'm very fit. That has made an enormous, enormous change, you know, uh, and, and I think it's helped me uh, very much in, in my mindset because mindset is what it's all about, isn't it? You, you and I, we talk about mindset all the time, and I talk about peak performance. How are we going to get peak performance? Well, I think through those seven pillars um, and, and also a very healthy disposition, uh, a healthy mindset, uh, but also a healthy body. So that's how I probably sum it up. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And I think being vulnerable as uh, leaders, as teachers, and just showcasing that every human on the planet has uh, issues that they're dealing with. And, and you're basically helping others who started out where you started out, hopefully avoid some of the difficulties that uh, that you and I went through. And I think that's why hopefully we're making an impact um, in this world. Speaking of impact, the great Tim Rice is a friend of yours. And he wrote the forward of your book, if I'm uh, correct there. Uh, and he's he's one of the most accomplished people in the world. What have you learned from him? Gosh, uh, that's, that's interesting. Um, I've spent quite a bit of time with Tim in England. I played for his cricket team about three times and um, and, I've, and I've been out to dinner with him a few times. Uh, and he's, he's, he was amazing. And he spoke the three waiters heaps of times as well, which is, which is great. He gave us our first big gig in England, which was massively important night. Tim is, I guess, when, I mean, he would probably say, look, I'm just extremely lucky. I was at the right time at the right, time at the right place. And um, you've got to remember the story of Tim Rice and Andrew Le- Lloyd Webber. It, it's an amazing one because the, the, what, what made them really go get big was Superstar. But they'd already written Joseph and his amazing technical dream code. And the reason that has became really big was because of Superstar, what they'd written afterwards. Superstar gave them this huge international breakthrough. And then, and then the world found out that they'd also written a show called Joseph as his amazing technical drink coach. So all of a sudden that was given a huge um, impetus as well. And now he would say he's very lucky about that because they, they wrote Joseph for an intermediate school, an, a, a, an intermediate school, um, you know, a bunch of 11, 12 year olds. Uh, and, um, it was originally only 40 minutes long. <laughs> and, um, just coming together and doing something small like that, they, they, were, they were two kind of university um, kind of dropouts. You know, um, Andrew was doing music and, and, and Tim was doing some kind of, um, you know, um, arts degree when they met. And, and, and they, they didn't do it to take on the world and be world beaters. They did it, you know, because they, they loved the, the genre of musical theatre. They didn't sit down and said, hey, let's be the new Rogers and Hammerstein. They, they, they said... Um, Let's have fun with this, and and look, oh hey, the school wants us to wants us, you know, has asked me, you know, do I know anyone who I can t- get together with and write a musical, you know, for the school, and you know, the, the kids can act out, and and that's how they found each other. Um, so I guess though, with Tim, he's also the bit you missed out is that he's a genius, uh, and <laughs> and and his lyric lyrical writing really is, it, it's it's in another, you know, paradigm. Um, his ability with words is just incredibly supersonic, and that's why he is really where he is today. He he is, you know, he, he's the who's the famous Wayne Gretzky. He's the Wayne Gretzky of of lyricists. He, he's just got that guy. He's the Michael Jordan, the guy who's just got that X factor. You can't quite put your finger on it. He he really just has that extra element, and 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 Lloyd Webber to a large degree as well. Um, you know, Lloyd Webber absolutely. He just knows how to write three, four or five great tunes within one musical and um, and put put it together with Tim Rice. And it's just an absolute marvel. It's, it, it, you know, it just works really well. Or, or, who, or the other lyricists that Angelo Webber's worked with as well. Those are two guys who just happen to be extremely good and clever who came together 
you know, um, and and was this incredible team. Um, this this duo. Um, I do want to touch on that too because Yuval, I don't know in your experience if you've been uh, if you've had a business partner in your in your um, world, um, but a lot of the time we go into business, we do actually do partnerships. A lot of the time, I I, I my business partner was was extremely important in the three waiters. Um, I don't have a business partner now with Lovegrove Entertainment, but um, you know he 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 had the background in opera, uh, and um, uh, I I had the background sort of rock and roll, but. Together, we, we were able to come together and 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 put that product together. So, so the the you know he he had so much expertise in that area that that and I had the drive and um to to that we worked really well. Even though we we're kind of chalk and cheese, we we managed to come together. And that's what Tim Rice and Andrew Lloyd Webber did. Mean ways they're quite different people, uh, and uh, you know they were never really best mates, but they were very good at working together. Um, I kind of like Benny and Beyond really. Yeah, so so you're asking about Tim Rice. I I don't know as the answer to that. I'm I'm just sort of guessing out. Uh, uh, you know, the feel I get from that. He he is firstly just incredibly talented, ridiculously talented, world class. He he'll go down as one of the greatest writers of musical theatre that there ever was. Uh, and 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 he you know he had drive. He had, he must have had drive. He he's very good at I think at finding the time to sit down and writing. Um, and, and he's finding finding the time uh, of um. Being involved in other people's work as well, you know, he he does go and and see other people's uh, work, people who want to work with him. Um, he's very still very interested in the genre, um, and he still loves his rock and roll. He's very much a rock and roller of the fifties and sixties. He just loves fifties and sixties rock and roll. He's you know he still loves listening to Chuck Berry and um, Bill Haley and and the Beatles and all that kind of stuff and Elvis Presley. So he he's still very much in that w- early world of rock and roll. He absolutely loves it. And he's just he's just there at the right time as well. You know, he'd, he'd be the first to admit that at the right time to write something which goes on becomes incredibly uh, successful, and you just sleep. And every and we wake up every morning, you made a million dollars because all these shows all around the world and the, the sums you're getting from the royalties. You know, it's it's a dream. It's a ridiculous. <laughs> it's ridiculous how much money he makes. But uh, um, you know, hey. <laughs> You know, it's, it is, it is about partnership. I did have uh, a previous business, which didn't go as, as well as planned. Uh, and that was partly due to my co-founder who I didn't uh, particularly uh, work well with. I was a first time uh, founder or CEO and, and she was a little more experienced, but, but I think, you know, having a partner like I have now, a co-founder makes all the difference in the world. You know, that collaboration, the ability to uh, to create together, to utilize specific skill sets that the other one doesn't have and bring it together uh, is is like nothing else. If if there's one thing that I would, and I speak about this a lot on my podcast, but if there's nothing else, find a great partner that has skill sets that benefit the organization as a combo rather than an individual is really one of the, the key ways of at least you know having a chance of success, but you you wrote a book. Uh, why haven't I heard of you? And I love the title. What was your inspiration to write it, and where did the title come from? Um, okay, um, well, firstly, the, the the byline is really why I wanted to write it because underneath I say it's a blueprint for standing out in a crowded, crazy, changing new world. I thought if I'm going to write a book which really is going to have any valuable f- value for anyone. Um, I don't. I, I'm not. I'm not a famous. I'm not a famous. Famous person. So therefore, I, I want it to be semi biographical. But that's not going to really have a. That's not really what the thing's going to be about. Is it? What do I have to say for all that? You know, for my for my life. Have I got really something of value to contribute? And I do think I do know ways of of finding ways of standing out in a crowded, crazy, changing new world. And so therefore, that's why the byline came, and that's why I did it. Now, how did the title itself come about? Um, it's quite, quite interesting. I was, um, you know, the story, I, I don't know if you're able to read all of the book, but as you know, in between the chapters, I, I write, uh, uh, uh one or two pages of, of an interesting, um, moments in my life during my career. It might be, um, anything from the night of my first show when there was a bomb scare in, in the theater, uh, or, or the time I was stuck in Havana, Cuba, and cause I didn't have my passport on me or, or something like that. And the, the, what I call them are, are little diversions. And um, one of them, Yuval, it was about the day that I got up early in Sydney 
to catch a fly- plane to the middle of Australia, a place called Alice Springs, to uh, present a keynote to a big insurance company. And this was early days of my keynote um, career. And this is going to be a really big day. I had to I, I had to do this because I knew there's a lot of important people there and I could get a lot of um, engagements as a result. The whole network of, of, of the, the, the road, the arterial roads that I take to get from where I live to Sydney Airport was, was well, halfway to the Harbour Bridge, the Sydney, famous Sydney Harbour Bridge, was clogged. Come on, actually, I could tell you that story, but I'm not going to tell the story because it'll take up too much time. It's in the book. The real story is, is because it leads to the, what the question was, is once I, I did get there, I did get there through speeding through the inner lane and risking seven different um, cameras and whatever and being pulled over, which I never did, and I made it. Uh, and ch- they'd already closed the gate, but they opened it a minute later because I screamed at them saying, you have to open it. <laughs> I've been through hell to get here kind of thing. And they let me on it. <clears throat> and... Uh, when I got there, obviously it was a three-hour flight, so I'd had time to calm down. The guy who was running this very big event um, at, uh, came up to me, and said, "Oh, so you're Daryl Lufko? I'm, I um, I've, uh, don't know anything about you, but my client." And when we were sitting down discussing the speakers, uh, they said, "Well, the first speaker we want is Daryl Lufko," and and then and I didn't know who you were, and so I put your name down, and then I helped them get their other speakers. So I'm interested to see what you're going to do today. So I, I did my keynote. And I walked up to, I walked off and had one of those great moments where he came up to me and he went, why haven't I heard of you? And when I told this story to a, a, a girl called uh, um, Jackie here in Sydney who helped me write my book, she's, that's what she does, she help, helps uh, writers write books. When I told her that story, she went, that's a great name for a book. And I went, oh, why haven't I? I suppose it is, isn't it? Because it asks the question, why, why haven't I heard of you? In other words, um, yeah, uh, because it's not not in the sense that why well, haven't I heard of you? Because you're just a nobody. It's it's no. It's because there's something about you, and yet I haven't heard about you. So why haven't I heard about you? You you you've got something about you, and so that so it's a question I guess to all entrepreneurs. They know they've got something about them. They know that there's something or anybody who who is uh, who has aspirational, you know, who has got something to give in this world, but maybe as needs needs a ways of finding a way to leverage themselves. Um. Is that the question? Is is that why the hell haven't people heard of you? And and once you've worked that out, well, do something about it. Do something about people hearing about you. And that's what the book's really about. <laughs> is it is to provide that is to, to hopefully provide that blueprint for standing out in a crowd of crazy, changing you will. So people finally have heard of you, um, and you can take it from there. Because personal branding is a very important, uh, very important thing. It's just something I've hated. Because I've always hidden behind ca- uh, characters, or I've hidden behind shows. It's a very, int- very easy for me to sell the show I'm in, um, uh, and and you know what you're going to get from the show. But it's very difficult when all of a sudden you start talking about what I do, you know, you, what you yourself do, and you know you should employ me rather than the show or this or the character that I'm playing, whatever. <laughs> so yeah, that's that's why I called it. Why haven't I heard of you? So wake up, call to everybody. Why haven't why haven't we? Why haven't people heard of you? Well, this book's going to help you um, find a way of of getting your message out there and getting your name out there. I, I love it. You're a great marketer because you left a whole bunch of open loops to, uh, out there. And I think everyone's going to uh, be looking for that book. And you know who's heard of you? The Seven Hatters have heard of you now. Hopefully they're going to reach out and uh, and find out more. What I'd like to do as a final question is I'd like to close on my interviews with the following. Who did you have to stop being and who did you need to become to manifest all of your success? Oh, that's a fantastic question. Um, I'm not sure if I had to change anything because I think my natural uh, exuberance and outward personality is my brand. And if I ever lost that along the way, I don't think that would have been a good thing. If I needed to feel that I need to be someone else. Don't get me wrong. When the three waiters started in the first six months, I realized I had to change my mindset um, from being an actor to becoming a business person. But in that same way, I didn't want to lose um, the reason that people kind of um, warmed to me in the first place. I'm a people person. I'm really good at meeting people, shaking hands and, and getting to know you and, and, and you getting to know me. And um, 
and I knew that would help me in the business world. Um, but I had to stop. I had to make a big decision about, okay, getting out of the acting world is massive. You know, um, I've worked hard in that area and now I'm going to sort of leave it behind. Um, but that wasn't really a big sacrifice. So there's that. I'm going to let you down on that answer, I think, because I'm not sure I've got something that can really help you there. I, I'd like to think <laughs> uh, that I am still the same person as a 20-year-old. Just a bit more weathered and a bit more um, knowledgeable, but still, still naive to a certain extent. I hope I don't ever want to become a really hard and cynical person. Um, I still want to believe in tomorrow. I still want to believe that of about opportunities are there and to take them. Um, I don't want to be. <laughs> I've got plenty of reasons to give up in this business um, with all the you know. The, the bad things that have happened along the way, I could have got it lots of times and I would have felt pretty good at it for, you know, for doing it. But I just knew deep down that I couldn't because this is what really makes me happy. This is what I'm really passionate about. And I knew that with all the bad times that that, that will pass, they will pass. You know, you can, we can work through this and, and there will be great times again. The whole, that's how I've got through COVID. I want to, I'm desperate to get back on stage again. I'm desperate to, to really get in front of an audience and, um, um, you know, get that applause again. I've never, never lost that. You know, um, I'm an actor. It's my soul. I'm a performer and I need the applause. And I get it through the world of being a businessman and corporate entertainment because I'm still performing. I don't ever want to be just the businessman and let others go out and perform. I still want to perform myself. There's a few shows I'm not in that I put out there, but um, most of them I, I can be involved in if I want to. And I, and I choose Usually, yes, because that's what I love to do. It. Um, so I'm still really the, essentially the same person I always was. I'm, I'm excitable, I'm, I'm exuberant, I'm passionate, um, and I never want that to ever change. The moment that changed is really time to, to, to get out. And uh, so I'm not sure if, I, if, if I've ever said no to somebody, that stopped being someone, and when did I become someone, something else? I think I've just got smarter and more knowledgeable. but. Um, uh, as my ex-wife would say, um, that maybe I probably should have <laughs> at one stage evolved like she she probably said she did because she was nothing like the person I married. But um, uh, but, but at the end, but I problem with her is it's, I was still the same. <laughs> I think that's probably what what really happened. You know, I still want to be that kid. I, I'm still that kid who's like, what do we got next? Hey, come on. What are we doing next? Hey, let's do it. You know, kind of thing. Um, and I never want to lose that. So I still, I kind of think I'm the same guy. <laughs> you know, I, I love, I love that answer because a lot of my guests speak about shedding something that of their past and, and starting new with a new outlook, with a new opportunity. But I love your answer because you basically said, I like the kid that I am. I like the performer that I am. I like the fact that I have visions and, and I take risks and I, I do what actors do, which are ultimately business solopreneurs. Yeah. They're business people. They deal with their own, with their own stuff. But, but you've also obviously let go of bad habits and, and, and try to do your best every day. And so I got that from our conversation, but either way, I love, love, love that answer. And, you know, we can speak for, for weeks. I can, we can dig deep into, you know, the three black swan events. We can go into family and relationships and there's so many things. And hopefully maybe one day you'll come back in the future, but for now, let's tell all the seven hatters what you're currently up to and how they can connect with you. What I'm up to these days is, uh, I guess um, I'm looking forward to getting back into the corporate events industry. Um, and so, but you guys, most of you, I'm sure your listeners um, would be in the United States. So, so we can't really contact that way, but um, I guess the, the way to keep in touch, I'd love to keep in touch first is to, to hear from you. I'm on LinkedIn and, and um, Yuval, you'll have some, um, um, some links there to share with people. I guess the, 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 the thing we could really connect the most in is, is the book. Um, so look, I, I think you're going to get a tremendous uh, out of the book. Um, I really do. I've written it for specifically for, um, people who, um, entrepreneurs who, people who want to, um, maybe make some changes in their lives, uh, to, uh, reach that real potential that they have. Um, people who are at a crossroads and want some inspiration to, 
uh, make a decision whether to take door number A or door number B and, um, you know, to actually really make a decision. It's, it's a tough thing a lot of the time um, making, you know, life-changing decisions. Um, I'm, I'm looking for people who want to reinvent themselves um, and maybe find that there's something else that, in their life that they can do. Maybe there is a, there's the second or third chapter in their life that they should now start thinking about um, entering into. Um, uh, so if you're, if you're one of those people, read the book and, and let me know what you think. Um, I th- the books are very, very entertaining. I've written in a, an entertaining way. Um, it's got some great stories in there from my world, which is the world of showbiz, and I think you're going to enjoy them anyway. But it's the messages, especially the second and third part. The first part's autobiographical. It's a pretty interesting story. And the second and third is all about um, mindset and uh, the pillars that make up peak performance and, and ways that, ways to maybe look at look at the world and look at what you're doing, the, the choices you're making. And um, hopefully by the end of it, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll know what you need to do. Um, what's the next step that you need to take? So I'd love to hear from you guys uh, in any in any shape, way, shape, or form. Um, uh, and um, yeah, I'd love to hear your stories as well. I think that's the that's the kind of the value that I could really uh, offer if anyone today. The book is fantastic. Everyone should be reading it. Uh, very entertaining, but very filled with with knowledge bombs. I wanted to thank you, Daryl, for spending some time with me and the seven hatters today. It was a fascinating conversation, very entertaining. And I just love what you have to say. So again, thank you for being part of the seven hats. Thanks you, Val. And thanks for everybody uh, for listening in. I really, really appreciate it. Have a great, uh, a great 2022. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Daryl. Let's end today with a segment of the show that I refer to as, what can we hang our hat on? And here's my takeaway. Entrepreneurs understand that rejection is their barometer into how hard they're pushing their boundaries. It's proof that they're living life to the fullest. Rejection hurts because it creates an emotional wound in some, but successful entrepreneurs expect to be rejected, and they're not afraid to go for it, even when they suspect it may be a long shot. Being married to an actor, I can relate to Daryl's suggestion to not take it personally. It's a numbers game and you need to focus on the key differentiators you bring to the table. Think about what makes you, your product or service unique and improve on that as you face difficulty on your journey. Remember, if you never get rejected, you may be living too far inside your comfort zone. I wanna thank Daryl once again for joining me so that we can all benefit from his wisdom. And until next time, if you found this episode helpful, please hit that subscribe button and tell other entrepreneurs out there what value you receive from it so we can attract even more high-quality people into our Seven Hats community. So for now, I will bid you farewell and success on your journey. And until next time, my name is Yuval Selleck, and I tip my hat to you.